Hello, Fine Young Chemistry students. This is Mrs. Deskevich, and I'm going to take some time today to go over a few things about acids and bases. We could spend almost a whole semester on acids and bases um, to the next level, but we're just going to give you kind of like the intro, and um, hopefully you'll go on, and it'll make a lot more sense in the future for you. First off, there's three major types of acids and bases that we refer to. And the first one is the Arrhenius type. Now, Arrhenius, this was in the 1800s, 1880s, and this was the acid equation where we thought that um, the HCl, for example, an acid, hydrochloric acid, would just break down into its ions. And so it would break down into solution in the ions. That's why it's aqueous, okay? And in an Arrhenius base, what would happen is the base would break down into its ions, being an OH as Na plus and OH minus, and it would break down into water, as you see the aqueous. The problem with this is the acids and bases dissociate in water into its ions. Um, that means that it's very narrow definition. And it also means that all acids and bases are aqueous, which is not entirely true. Most, many acids and bases are aqueous. However, there are many that aren't. And so that's why it's very difficult to use the Arrhenius um, model for everything. So that's definitely the narrowest definition model. The next type of model was in the early 1920s, and this was from um, the Lewis model. And the Lewis model, if you think about um, a Lewis structure, Lewis structure talks about electrons, so that kind of makes the connection. It's the same Lewis guy. A Lewis acid is an electron pair acceptor, and a Lewis base is an electron pair donor. Notice we're looking at it from the electron perspective instead of the proton perspective, unlike the other two models. As a result of this, the acid's able to form a covalent bond with whatever supplies the electrons. Um, that's a nice idea, and that works for some situations. However, this is the broadest definition model. Instead, what we're gonna focus on is the Bronsted-Lowry definition. And this was also developed in the 1920s. And basically, Bronsted-Lowry definition says that anything, an acid is anything that donates a proton, and base is anything that accepts a proton. So we refer to acids simply as proton donors, bases as proton acceptors. If you look at our equation here, you're gonna see sulfuric acid, H2SO4. Obviously that's gonna be our acid. And since our acid is a proton donor, it's going to release one of its hydrogens to, in this case, the base, because the base is water. So basically when sulfuric acid is dissolved into water, you can see this, what, this, how this is going to happen. And so therefore, you have what we call a conjugate base, or the base that goes with our original acid, where we're one hydrogen short. So we have a bisulfate ion, we're one hydrogen short. However, that extra hydrogen went with a hydronium ion. So the Bronsted-Lowry base in this case, and you would think, why is water a base? Well, sometimes with the Bronsted-Lowry equation, sometimes water can be an acid. But in this case, this water is accepting the proton. That's why it's considered the base. Therefore, its conjugate acid is the H3O+, or what we call the hydronium ion. Basically, you guys, we don't want you to get too confused at this point, but we want you to see that when we have something like acid, for example, that dissolves in water, we always talk about when, when things dissolve in water, they go to the party, um, the ions separate each other, and they go and hang out with some other things. Well, in this case, we're actually hanging out and creating this ion being a hydronium ion. What that hydronium ion's doing is, the more that that hydronium ion, the more that there is, the greater acidity um, the solution is going to have. This model in turn works best for our purposes and especially those going on to AP. We're going to look a lot more with these conjugate acids and bases. Now some common properties of acids. Um, you've probably heard of these before, but acids produce hydrogen ions in water. 
And again, we're looking at the model where that hydrogen ion actually attaches to a water molecule and becomes that hydronium ion. Um, typically, acids taste sour, not that you should taste all acids. Um, acids can definitely corrode metal. So if you ever, even if you need to clean up like some rust on something, sometimes even something like Coca-Cola works. Acids are also electrolytic, meaning that they can conduct an electric current. The reason is, is because there's so many ions present um, in the solution and ions are what basically carry electricity. Also, acids react with bases to form a salt and water. The pH is less than seven and we'll get back to the pH here in just one second. And finally, it turns blue litmus paper to red. So red indicates an acid. Looking at the bottom here, you're gonna see the, the picture that's I'm covering up is battery acid. That's definitely a very strong acid. Then you have citrus, you have stomach acid, which is a very strong acid. You have vinegar, and then coffee is even slightly acidic. Now we have some common properties of bases, and bases produce these OH minus ions in water. And sometimes, again, our bronsted lowry model looks at it, that they attach to something else. Um, typically, there's a bitter or chalky type of taste, and it's also electrolytic, meaning we can also conduct an elect electric current because there's ions, even though those ions are OH minus ions. Typically, bases feel soapy or slippery, and they react with acids to form a salt and a water. The pH is greater than 7, which is different than an acid, and it turns red litmus paper blue, so the color for bases is blue over red. Now, what is pH? Because pH really tells us how acidic or basic something is. So pH is a reading, then, of telling us if something's acidic or basic based on the number of hydrogen ions that are present. So how do we figure that that pH of 7 is neutral? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this for a second, move my screen, because I want you to see this at the bottom. This is the auto-ionization of water. And so what happens is if, like water just sitting there will ionize, and it will ionize as to H3O+, plus, which is the hydronium ion, and it'll ionize to the hydroxide ion as well. So that's one reason why that water can actually is a very good conductor of electricity, because it auto-ionizes. You don't have to do a thing to it to actually ionize the water, at least a little bit. Now what you'll see is 1 times 10 to the negative 7, that's going to be 0 0.00, so 7 spaces 1, is the concentration of hydrogen ions produced by the dissociation of the pure water. So keep that number in mind, the 1 point or 1 times 10 to the negative 7. Sorry about that. Okay. Therefore, we're led to the pH equation. So we have a pH equation and it has a lovely log 10. It is a base 10 system, the pH is. And you see pH equals negative log 10 of the concentration, those hard brackets mean concentration of the hydrogen ions. So what you're gonna do is if you try this, and I do want you to try this, plug it into your calculator and plug in negative log 10 and put in the brackets one times 10 to the negative seven and you're gonna get a pH of seven. You're just gonna get the number seven. Hence, that's why it's a negative in front of that because if you just did log 10 times one times 10 to the negative seven, you're gonna get negative seven. That's why the negative's there, just to make that two negatives make a positive. That means though, that a pH of six has 10 times the number of hydrogen ions, making it 10 times stronger of an acid. So, just going one space on the pH scale from a seven to a six is 10 times stronger of an acid. So that means then if you go from a six to a five, you have 10 times the number of hydrogen ions than you had for a pH of six, a hundred times then stronger than a pH of seven and so forth. Now, you may think that a pH scale will simply go from zero to 14 in a sense or one to 14, Actually, there are some, some things that are so acidic. Um, I think the most acidic um, um, acid that we know of is a negative 35 pH. So just think how many more times hydrogen ions are in there making it that much stronger. 
The pH scale is something that you're accustomed to, and you see it here, it says zero to 14. And what you'll see, um, battery acids, stomach acids are very, when you go to one end, like these are very strong acids. And as you get closer to the middle, as you get close to neutral, they're actually weaker. So the weaker acids are closer to neutral as the weaker bases are closer to neutral. And as you get further away or to the extreme end, that's when you get the stronger bases. Stronger bases can burn you just as much as acids can. Many people like, you know, they think, oh my gosh, acids can burn your skin. Bases can too. So that is where you definitely need to be careful. And if you're ever in the lab and you feel your hands very, very slippery, you probably have a base on them. So what you need to do is neutralize it first, then wash your hands with water and soap. Um, if you have an acid on your hand, neutralize it first with a base solution and then wash it with soap and water. Typically, if we're working with bases and acids in the lab, I will have the, the contrary so that you can use those if you get those on your hands so you can neutralize it. Now, there are some pH testing possibilities here, and one simple one that you guys probably have seen before is blue litmus paper and red litmus paper. So if you'll notice red litmus paper, if you put a drop of base, it'll turn blue, and blue litmus paper, if you put a drop of acid, it'll turn red. Great. Litmus paper is great for a quick test. It won't tell you, though, how basic or how acidic something is. So that is a problem with litmus paper. We also have what we call pH hydrium paper is what you'll see in the upper right hand corner here. The pH hydrium paper, sorry about that. Um, basically it, it can give us an indication of where, um, how acidic or basic something is. Um, the only thing that's a little more difficult with the pH hydrium paper is sometimes those colors, it's very hard to tell um, between like a nine and a 10, for example, or between a two and a three, for example. So sometimes that can be a little more difficult, but it's giving us a broader scale. You can also use, um, you can, you know, compare them to uh, indicators of different types. The best way and most accurate way is um, a pH probe here that you see in the bottom right hand corner. And this pH probe is digital. It's awesome. A lot of times they're um, hooked up to computers. We may have one that works on a good day. So um, we would like to get more of those pH probes. Um, you also have indicators like phenolphthalein. So an indicator can be a liquid indicator here. And like you see, phenolphthalein turns purple and pink in the presence of a base. If you have phenolphthalein in an acid, it'll remain colorless once it's in a base or once it has those OH ions or base ions there you're going to have that phenolphthalein color. Natural indicators, um, you can also have, I mean, honestly, you could go in your fridge or in your household and get things for pH testing. You can use red cabbage, you can use baking soda, you can use um, vinegar. It's super easy to come up with lots of different ways to do some acid-based testing. A titration though is something we're gonna work on in class and I want you guys to understand what we're doing and titration is very common and um, as you get further along in chemistry, it's a very common lab technique. And what it is, it's a carefully controlled neutralization reaction because we wanna find that very point where a reaction, where an acid and a base finds the neutral point. And so what you have is a solution of an unknown concentration of an acid or a base and a second solution of a known concentration called your standard solution. And so you're basically trying to find the concentration of your unknown. The goal is to find the end point. So that's where the total moles of H plus donated by the acids equal to the total moles of H plus accepted by the base. Now, this is very hard to find. And this is a very common setup here. And what you have is you have a burette and a burette allows you, remember there's a stopcock there, and you're able to open and close that and even open and close it to drops. Um, you have a base of a known concentration in your burette. Oftentimes you put the base in your burette, but you can always, it can go the opposite way. You also have an acid of unknown concentration down here. 
your acid then, what's going to happen is you put a little bit of phenolphthalein. That's why you have like this purple color down here, even though it's not purple when it's in an acid solution. So this is after an acid-based titration has occurred for it to turn purple. Now, what's going to happen, here's an example. Let's say I put 0.5 molar sodium hydroxide. And sodium hydroxide is a great base to titrate with. And 0.5 molar is not super duper strong. And what I'm going to do is I have um, 50 milliliters then of hydrochloric acid in this Erlenmeyer flask along with a couple drops of phenolphthalein. So what's going to happen then is I'm going to read my burette, allow some of the NaOH to come down here into um, the Erlenmeyer flask. And when I get to the point where I'm literally on drops, because I want to see, I want that pink to be super light and I want it to stay light and I want it to stay light pink, but I don't want it to become very, very dark. I just want it to be a very slight indication. Um, when that happens, I'll take the volume of how much sodium hydroxide I use. I have the volume of the hydrochloric acid. And what I, I'll do is I'll take the molarity of the hydrochloric acid. So basically we have three parts and we need a fourth one. Now this fourth part that we need is the molarity of the hydrochloric acid. So let me move my, my head a little bit again here. <laughs> there, I'll drag it up here. Okay, um, what you'll see here is I have my equation and my equation's balance is a one to one to one to one ratio. So I'm gonna find the moles of sodium hydroxide used and I'm just gonna manipulate my molarity equation to do that. So I'm gonna take moles equals the molarity times the volume. So my molarity of NaOH is 0.5 and I'm gonna multiply it by 0 0.025. I'm gonna make sure I change my um, volume to liters. And I'm gonna get 0 0.0125 moles of sodium hydroxide. Then I'm gonna use stoichiometry um, to do this, and this should say, sorry, 0 0.0125 moles of sodium hydroxide, and I'm going to use my one-to-one -one ratio from stoichiometry. Now, sometimes, obviously, we're not going to have a one-to-one -one ratio up here, so you have to check using your stoichiometry. And then finally, I multiply that through, and so I get 0 0.0125 moles of hydrochloric acid. Now, once I have my moles of hydrochloric acid, I can plug it into my molarity equation. So I have now molarity equals 0 0.0125 moles, my moles of hydrochloric acid, divided by, I use 50 milliliters of hydrochloric acid. So I change that to liters, and I get a 0.25 molar hydrochloric acid solution. So titrations can be very, very helpful in this regard. So we can figure out the concentration of some unknowns, and that can be very helpful um, when you're working with any acids and bases, and, and it's very common. Um, process. We are going to do some titrations in class and you're going to love it. All right, let's go and learn some more about acids and bases. I'll talk to you soon, guys. Bye-bye.